Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our sunset safari, where Brian and myself have been lucky enough to start off our day with three very sleepy Nkuhuma lionesses. Brent is out and about on Jigger with Andrew, looking for all kinds of other magical safari animals to show you. Welcome, we are coming to you live from Juma and Arethusa game reserves within the Sabi Sands of the Greater Kruger National Park area in South Africa. And we are thrilled to have you on board. And not only are we live, but we are also interactive. So if you want to send through your questions, you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And we'd love to hear from you. Doesn't necessarily have to be about the lions, although we always enjoy answering questions about them, but anything that you might see or experience or have always wanted to know about coming out on a safari in South Africa. And we're starting off this afternoon with a nice, cool, cloudy cover which, as I'm sure many of you know, comes as a relief to all of us at Wild Earth, just to have a bit of a break from scorching hot temperature. And apparently it is 26 degrees centigrade, which is 78 in Fahrenheit. So I think it's a little bit hotter than that, personally. I mean, not to contradict the weather station, but it, the real feel I think whenever there's a gap in the cloud, we get a little bit of those UV rays coming through. And for those of you visiting for your first time on safari, days like today are the days where you are going to get sunburned. We always know now to go out with sunblock on. Those of us who've grown up in South Africa and returned away from a day with such incredible sunburn where you don't expect to have it, this is the kind of day where you layer it on. But for those of you who don't know, my name is Jamie, and I have Brian on camera with me this afternoon. And as I said, <laughs> Look what's swimming through your screen. <laughs> and as I said, we've started off our afternoon with only three of the Inkahuma lionesses. I know that you were with them this morning on the sunrise safari with James, and there were only three then as well. We know that at least one of the lionesses is mating with a Birmingham boy. It was around in Coral. I'm not sure where that couple has moved. The rest of the Birmingham boys are on Torchwood, on a buffalo kill. Oh, that's an awesome message from Tamara. And Tamara's been watching for nine months and says it's like a little holiday every day, which is one of the wonderful reasons that I love our live safaris. She said it's a, she's offered us a big thank you for providing her with a little vacation period every day. It's an absolute pleasure, Tamara, and I'm glad that we've been able to provide you with some interesting facts for you to learn about. Our lions today, usually incredibly picturesque and cooperative, have decided that they're going to pick the most difficult block in which to hide themselves, disappearing behind the branches, and looking highly content. <coughs> and Deborah, I know this morning you were watching with James and you notice that one of the lionesses had a bad limp. And there have been some suggestions that maybe it might even have happened when they were trying to hunt the wildebeest, which is apparently how Brian and James found them this morning. But Deborah wants to know if the injured lioness looks any better. Deborah, I have to confess to you, given their current positioning and current um, positions, as it were, I haven't been able to make a judgment call on that. I can't tell. I'm not even sure at this point which lioness it is. I've actually, due to some um, slight scheduling surprises, I've actually been sitting here for the last 40 minutes. And so far, the sole extent of movement has been one paw that moved and one lioness that lifted her head earlier. Beyond that, they've decided that this afternoon is nap time and we appear to have interrupted them. Now, I'm not planning on spending the entire three hours with them. I will at some stage leave them to their nap and come back when it's a little bit cooler and there's more chance of them moving out and about. It's still a treat to get to spend a little bit of time with them. 
They do look hungry, so you're going to have to stay tuned because we will be st sticking with them as much as we can as the evening draws to a close. Paw wrapped around the log. And since the lions are being uncooperative in terms of where they've decided to place themselves, a big thank you to Andreen, who is commenting on my um, new hairstyle. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoy it. Thanks, Andreen. I was brushing my hair and got bored when I went to put it in the normal braid or plait and decided that maybe a two would suffice where one had failed this morning. It was also just one of those days where the hair was not being terribly cooperative. It might, might be time to remove some of it, maybe cut half of it off. But for now, it is braided in a way that we couldn't decide if it was Pollyanna or Pocahontas. That was James's comment. He did have a good giggle though when he first saw me. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and reposition, just get you a slightly different view for our last few moments with them before we move off. And while I do that, let's pop over to Brent so that he can say hello. Good afternoon and welcome to Sunset Safari. My name is Brent Garrismith. We're on a live African game drive and I found what I was looking for. Uh, there were some Ellies that were disappearing from the Jimmy Water Hole a bit earlier and I thought they might have moved into this area. And here they are. Lovely little bull here with a nice set of ivory. I'm just going to give you a quick glimpse through the, the trees before we move into a better position. I have Andrew Joseph Francis on camera with me this afternoon and welcome to a safari live weekend. Hopefully lots in store for you. Hello big boys. Oh, lovely set of ivory on there. Let's get around and have a good look at them. Looks quite young, but with tusks like that, he could be a magnificent animal in a few years. Sorry, it's just quite a technical area to get the vehicle into just looking for the best spot but I don't believe Andrew hooked on a very sharp thorn. Cameramen tend to get a little bit upset when we do that. Unless of course we're following wild dogs in there as engrossed as we are. incredible wherever you might be in the world you're about to go have a look at a group of elephant bulls live so we are coming to you live from the Sabi Sands Game Reserve in South Africa in more detail on the Juma and Arethusa private game reserves at the moment we are on Juma and this is the second member of Africa's Big Five on this sunset safari after Jamie has been sitting with ladies from the Inkahuma Pride. There you go, so that Ellie Bull was about to move down towards this little creek bed here. And we're gonna just behave like an elephant for a second and push over this dead branch here so we can get through without getting stuck. There you go. So there we go just like an Ellie would have done if that had been in his way. There's some other young bulls up on the crest here that are just moving away from us. But the guy I really wanted to see, he's got that very impressive bit of ivory. He's right here. Hello, big boy. So still not too big yet, but has got really impressive ivory, and I think it's going to grow into some really magnificent tusks one day. I guess he's probably late 20s. And feeding off 
a little oh there we go you can see even though he is a big elephant uh, he's still got a bit of growing to do being a little bit shy i actually haven't seen this ball before andrew have you not that i can recall so this might be a new ball with this really dry weather we're having we're getting a lot of elephants that we don't normally see and they could be coming from hundreds of kilometers away so really exciting and we do love spending time with ellies let's just reposition slightly is commenting on my hairdo the sunset safari wondering is that some sort of samurai top knot it has been called the safari samurai before uh, but generally with long hair when it gets really hot out here it's just a little bit cooler okay you can see he's not the most relaxed so i'm going to give him a bit of space he's just moving away and we're not sure where he comes from but generally his body language is not aggressive just a little bit nervous so i'm going to sit here and let him get used to us so he's still carrying on feeding. It's a very important tree he's made his way to, or type of tree that we are going to be seeing a lot of animals very reliant on for the next few months as it's very dry. And it's called a buffalo thorn or a zizifus. Macronatum is its scientific name and it's one of our only true evergreens that is actually very tasty to the animals. So elephants, kudu, impala, bushbuck, inyala will all rely very heavily on this particular tree during this very dry time. Well, a very warm Safari Live welcome to Protopod on YouTube and Protopod is possibly a new time, uh, well, not a, maybe not a first time viewer, but a new viewer. So great to have you on the back of the vehicle with us, Protopod. And Protopod is wondering, how long do elephants live for? Well, they can live for up to 65 years, but generally anything between 55 and 60 is an acceptable lifespan for an elephant. So they actually run out of teeth and I know a lot of our regular viewers will know this, but just in case there's someone out there who's feeling quick on the keyboard, who can tell me how many, tell me how many sets of teeth an elephant has in its lifetime? And you can send that through to questions at wildearth.tv, or if you're on Twitter, just use the hashtag Safari Live. So how many sets of teeth does an elephant have in its lifetime? Well, speaking about teeth still, not the teeth that I'm talking about inside the elephant's mouth, those two big modified canines, which are an elephant's tusks, those con grow continuously through an elephant's life. So they never stop growing. And they do break occasionally on certain individuals, but they do grow throughout the elephant's life. David in the UK was watching the Juma Dam cam. For those of you not sure, when the live safaris aren't on, we have a camera on a water hole, on a few water holes across Africa that run 24 hours a day. So you can watch lots of different animals coming there. And in this dry time, especially elephants, buffalo, spend a lot of time around those water holes. So David was watching that water hole camera. And David is wondering whether that floppy here eared elephant is here he's actually behind us i can't see him right now he's moved through this little uh, river system up to the other side and he had in the air that looked like it was almost folded now it probably is cartilage damage and david's wondering what could have caused that uh, sparring with another elephant and it's probably the most likely that it's actually damaged the cartilage so he doesn't have the full control over the ear like this guy does here so if we have a look back at his ear there andrew so Obviously, because the elephants are able to move his ear, there we go, a little bit up to the top there. 
And you can see there's also ligaments attached. So it could also be uh, a ligament damage, but because it's only half of the ear that seems to be really affected, I didn't have a really good look at him. I saw him a little bit earlier, but in the distance. Uh, it could also be ligament damage, most likely from sparring with another bull, but, uh, or it could be a birth defect. Uh, I have to have a, a closer look at him. Hopefully we can catch up with him a little bit later on the safari. So still on that Ellie with the, the floppy ear, Ruth in Costa Rica is wondering, can it be damaged that the elephant's ear doesn't function correctly? Uh, Ruth, I think that's probably the case already with there, but elephants are incredibly adaptable creatures. I don't think it's going to affect his life. He might get a bit, bit warmer than the other Ellie's, not being able to cool the blood so much. Oh, well, listen to that. Incredibly powerful animals. So a very, very good question uh, from Trisha in Toronto, saying, especially now with this drought, we're getting elephants we possibly haven't seen before or might not have been in this area for a while, and it could have come from 100 kilometers away from the Kruger National Park somewhere. Uh, how can we be sure they're comfortable around cars? Well, Trisha, our job, uh, being safari people, is that we've know, we know elephants quite well and reading is behavior. So with some elephants, we're able to approach and we've seen how close they come to us. With this guy, I'm giving him a little bit more distance. I could see he wasn't comfortable. He wasn't angry, he wasn't upset. He just likes a little bit more space than certain elephants. So you've just got to read that, the, the body language that they give off. And you can see now he's completely, 100% chilled, uh, carrying on feeding. And if I see him again, I know now he's got a little bit of a sort of a bigger distance that I should stay away from him. But that can change. And especially if we drive carefully like we are now and, and considerately around the animals, uh, he might become really nice and used to the, the vehicles and, and could become as relaxed as some of the other big Eddie bulls we see re frequently. So well done to Elaine, Coda, Jane, Kat and Kathy and many, many others who got it spot on. An elephant has six sets of teeth in its lifetime. So once they get to about around 50, they're already on their last set of teeth and it wears down and they're unable to, to break down their, their food. So an elephant already only digests about 60% of what it eats. So as they get older and those teeth get completely worn down, it's going to make it even more difficult and less and less of that of what it eats is going to be digested and often the ellies will actually die of starvation or occasionally they are so starved they'll, they'll fall down next to a water hole and, and drown. It's very seldom that the, an elephant is killed by an animal. There we go, he's coming out into the open. You can see why I'm saying he's not, he's very tall at the shoulder, probably only about three meters or so. At the shoulder, he's still, I feel, got a bit of growing to do before he's fully grown. And those tusks are definitely going to keep growing into quite a spectacular. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Andrew's just moving our radio communication area out of the way for you. I'm just going to give you one last look because he's going to go through an area we're not going to be able to follow. And we hopefully we'll see him go up a hill. It's always fun watching Ellie's go up a hill. And you often cannot believe the sort of gradients that they are able to climb. And what looks like he stopped for a snack. Right, looks like he's quite happy to continue feeding in the base of this little riverbed. The other Ellie's have moved up onto the, the top there. 
and I might actually loop round to see if we can catch up with him so I can have a good look at that floppy-haired individual. But while we do that, uh, let's jump on the back with Jamie and go have a look at those wonderful Inkuma lionesses. We've managed to find ourselves a slightly clearer position in order to have a look at the three lionesses who, while we've been here, absolutely haven't moved. They didn't even lift their heads before or while we repositioned. But we have had a nice opportunity while we were with, you were with Brent to just have a look at their condition and to see how they're doing. And if we have a look at this one female, now I'm not sure if this is the one with a limp or not, but just have a look around this female's eyelid and how incredibly uncomfortable and itchy must that be. Those are ticks. Those bulges around her eyelids are engorged ticks that have been feeding off her blood. And I cannot imagine how uncomfortable that must be. Now the ticks of that size and in these areas have such well adapted mouth parts to actually really clinging onto the animal that obviously she hasn't managed to remove them yet. But that really does look incredibly uncomfortable. And then of course she's got flies fluttering all around her. Little aspects of the wild that aren't necessarily as glamorous as we'd like to think it is. And that must be incredibly uncomfortable for her, although it doesn't seem to be disturbing her sleep too much. The ears going frantically to swish them away. But no other sign of life. Fast asleep. Well, they are looking not, I wouldn't say they're thin, but they're definitely hungry. Yeah, they're all entangled. They've really quite made themselves at home in this bush willow tree. Cuddling the branch, <laughs> wrapped around it, and then tucking her head under. And for those of you who were watching earlier, when I said they hadn't moved, <coughs> I, really mean, I really meant it. They have not stirred from their slumber. Now, last night was cloudy and windy, and it's pretty much, I would, it's guesswork, but I would say that it's a fairly educated guess to suggest that they were hunting the entire evening last night. Oh, big sleepy cuddle there. Here we go, a bit of movement. Now, as far as I can tell, it's the sub-adult on the left, the one that just cuddled herself, and then two adult females on the right. I'm not sure where the other adult is. I don't know where she's gone. Were there four yesterday, Brian? Were you with James? There was three yesterday as well. Okay, so that's very interesting. One lioness has gone wandering off. Maybe she's found another mating prospect. Somewhere in Buffles Hook, perhaps. Not an impossibility. Because as far as I know, the last time I saw the ladies, there were four of them. <laughs> I love that foot wrapped around the branch. And lions often do that, and you usually see them do it when they're full. It is a nice way of taking pressure off their stomachs. But why they do it when they're just resting, I don't know. I think it just is more comfortable. Shifting around, finding nice positions to rest yourself in. Just like our leopards are always capable of looking comfortable in the most uncomfortable looking situations. Lions are much the same. Oh, paws in the air. Which way are you gonna go, girl? Are you gonna lie on your back? Yep. Settle down. <laughs> and that appears to be the favoured position for now. For those of you joining us for the first time, um, for any new viewers out there, please let us know if you are watching and tell your friends as well that all kinds of exciting things can happen on a live safari. 
even if it's just a sleepy lion rolling over for now, it could well later be these three lionesses chasing down something to fill their stomachs with. <laughs> no ticks around the left eye that I can see, at least not as large as the one that were in the right. And again, completely fast asleep. And Kat, who's watching in Florida, you were saying you can see how they are top predators by how deeply they are asleep. And to a certain degree, that is absolutely true. They are far more relaxed, although I have seen leopards at times sleep just as deeply, even though they don't really fall, fall up into close to the top of the predator hierarchy. But what has always astounded me, and it continues to, is how the smallest noise, unexpected noise, the crunch of a branch or anything like that can send these cats from dozing away happily to up and on alert before you've even blinked an eyelid. The speed of their movement is absolutely phenomenal. Those reflexes that, and instincts that come into play. And you'd see it if, if Brian and myself had walked in instead of come in on the vehicle would have been a very, very different situation. They would have been completely on alert, quite comfortable. What we noticed yesterday, we were far from them when we first tracked them on foot out on tracking team, but they were nice and comfortable with our presence. We were about 100 meters away watching them across the drainage line and they just watched us for a bit. Although that tick collection around that lioness's eye does look terribly uncomfortable, and you'll see it on all of the animals if you look closely enough, and it's one of the things that this camera has been able to do, and bring us these phenomenal close-up shots of the parts of the animals we don't always get to see. And I wouldn't be surprised if those little brown or little black spots underneath her chin could well be ticks as well. But those incredibly engorged ticks that were sitting on that lioness's eye, Lynn, you were wondering if once they, once they are full like that, will they drop off? And yes, they will. Once they've eaten their full, they will drop off onto the ground and they will breed there. There are certain species of tick that will also breed on the host animal itself, but either way, they've got to unclasp their jaw from wherever they've positioned themselves. So even if it might be an animal that breeds or a tick that breeds on the host, they still have to then contend with the fact that their mouth parts are no longer keeping them attached. And there's a very good chance that that animal could shake them off or scratch them off. Of course, lions are more than capable of scratching their eyes, but the difficulty is really detaching them. The only way that they can scratch their eyes properly is with the side of their paw rather than using their claws. Obviously, they don't want their claws anywhere near their sensitive eyeballs or eyelids. <clears throat> and it clearly hasn't been good enough to dislodge her not-so-friendly passengers. Now, oh, whatever else these lionesses have been through, they have stuck together. And for new viewers, this pride has been through some very difficult and disjointed times over the last few months. But nonetheless, the bonds between the females, as with all lioness prides, are incredibly powerful. They're all related to each other in some way. And that keeps them united as a unit. They need each other to survive essentially and to be able to guard their prey from hyenas there's always safety in numbers with a lion pride but darlene you were wondering how would a nomadic lioness cope since whenever you've seen these lions they've always been so closely bonded lying close together head rubs together and essentially looking out for each other if you could put it like that or if you could term it like that and you were wondering if there what would happen to a nomadic female would she be able to survive? Would a lion pride ever accept her? And the answer is, generally in my experience, 
Lion prides have been incredibly hostile towards nomadic females that are unknown to them. And I suspect that recorded cases where nomadic females have been introduced into a pride might be more likely because prior to the research or prior to people realizing what was going on, those, that lioness was somehow associated with those lionesses before she'd become separated from them. So it does happen, lionesses do go off on their own. Usually it's when they have young cubs and they move off in order to keep them safe during a male takeover so that they're not killed, whilst the rest of the pride stays to placate them. You can see now with these females how strong this bond is. And we're probably, probably, not necessarily, but we could be looking at mother and daughter lying together there. She's, now the sub-adults decided to use the bush willow as a footrest. And it's actually really a nice perspective on that foot. Sorry, Darlene, I'll come back to your question because it's a really interesting one. But it's such a nice view of the underside of the foot. You really get to see the lobes at the back pad, that space that you see in the track between the toes and the back pad that's filled with fur. You can imagine how important that can be when picking your way amongst devil thorns and other sharp vegetation to try and help protect the delicate spaces between the toes. That's very interesting. <laughs> there is a very sneaky hideaway insect just below in a sort of a direct line from her toes, second from the left. There is a spider right above where that bark cracks or where it's been peeled away from the heartwood and there's a bit of a crack there. Believe it or not, there is a spider right in the center of your screens now. Very difficult for me to tell exactly what it is. Um, I didn't even spot it. It was actually Nikki who's watching in FC who spotted that. I was so busy being distracted by the lion's paw. Amazing. Just goes to show all kinds of things that you get to see with this, a particular camera. A really a close up view. And a spider like this has chosen a good place. If it is one of the species that tends to hunt flies, this is a good place to be attracted to because lions, of course, come with their own entourage of flying insects that keep them company on an endless basis. Now, my suspicion is that this is an actively hunting spider and it's probably trying to catch the various buzzing insects around the lions. But how interesting is that? One of those tiny little relationships in nature that you don't always get to see. Now, for the most part, those lionesses will ignore it unless it decided, of course, to run over some sensitive whiskers or ears or something like that. But I did want to go back to Darlene's question because I have, I know of a quite an interesting story of a lioness that ended up on her own, but it was a slightly different scenario. It was not in a nice open system like the one that we're in now. It was in a closed system, which meant that the lion population had to be managed. And one of the questions that was put forward was how would the lionesses respond to comp contraception? Because as a keystone species in a fenced area, an overpopulation of lions would lead to the destruction of the rest of the prey species and the other predators. So what they did was they tried to contracept this female and the males started to lose interest in her very slowly as they worked out that she wasn't fertile. And as a result, the rest of the pride seemed to as well. And she slowly but surely was pushed out and out into the outskirts until she eventually left and moved off on her own. And she survived and she, the contraceptives wore off. She had three healthy cubs that she managed to raise to adulthood all by herself and essentially found a new, a new pride. But she was never ever accepted back into her original family. So an interesting example of where it, entirely well-meaning research and one that is necessary in terms of managing the slightly smaller private areas that are a crucial part of the conservation industry within this country but an interesting case of how a lesson, a very harsh lesson was learnt about that kind of situation. Then in contrast, the mother of that same pride was 
at that point very, very old for a lioness. She was about 14. She'd be wandering around with her two sub-adult, the last sort of set of cubs that she'd had. She was running around with two sub-adult males. She'd split from the pride because of a pride takeover, as I spoke of before. And she then, years later, after her sub-adults were fully grown, she then rejoined the group. She had a broken leg. We don't know how it was broken. And she managed to survive for a long time with the protection of the pride around her. Uh, just an interesting and contrasting case. And she was probably at one point the dominant or the, one of the oldest females within that pride before she split away from it. But for lone lionesses, and they do happen, their chances are much, much less. Or their chances of survival is far lower, let me put it that way. And they have less chance of being accepted by an unrelated pride. While we were observing that lioness's paw, which unfortunately she's put down again, but you wanted to know what that calloused pad at the back was, just behind the back pad, and that actually forms part of the lion's wrist. And you were wondering what that is called, and I actually don't know, there we go, well done, Brian. I don't actually know what the official name for it is. I know that it's a callus pad that's part of the way that the joints work and they quite often use it to lie on in a similar way to the chestnuts on the inside of horses or zebras' legs. It's basically a place that gets a lot of friction as so has evolved. It's basically their heel, essentially. Their heel or the back part of their wrist. I'm not sure what the official name is. I'll have to double check up on that. A lion's paw structure is one of those fascinating things. It's known as digitigrade foot posture, where the metatarsals or the metacarpals, so those long bones in your hands and your feet, in lions are extended right backwards. So that what we think of as their knee is actually their wrist or their ankle, and their knee is situated further up. So that's the ankle joint that we are looking at now and that part below it is part of the heel, essentially. Oh, Maggie? Just to go back for one last moment, and we are going to be leaving these lions shortly. We'll come back to them, I promise, as soon as things start to get cooler. But Maggie, who's watching in Australia, you wanted to know how long do ticks suckle for or draw blood for? Do we know the sort of rough cycle from when they attach themselves to when they drop off? And Maggie, it can be anything from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. And the reason I say that is because it's species dependent. Some ticks have different numbers of life cycles to others. So certain ticks, blue ticks, bond ticks, red ticks, will all have either what's known as a one phase, two phase, or three phase life cycle, where they go through a metamorphosis. And it just depends on the species of the tick itself. These large game ticks, these big ticks, which are usually bond ticks, um, which is the one that I'm thinking of most obviously. There's another tick, but it's escaped my mind that's very commonly found on these animals. But for them, that time spent engorging themselves on blood and preparing to mate is quite an extended period of a couple of days to up to a week or two. It just, again, depends on the species of tick itself. I think it's time for us to leave these <coughs> lovely lionesses. Uh, they are sitting, resting very peacefully. I am sitting resting, sitting, resting less peacefully because I had to park myself in a tree in order to get you a nice view. But while we go out in search of other things and before we return to the lionesses, let's pop over to Brent who has relocated the elephants. So we came looking for those bulls and we found a breeding 
being heard. It's a really strong possibility that those balls are... Oh, hello, Mr. Man. Very cheeky. And I think those bulls are following this breeding herd. They're not too far. I can actually almost hear the bulls coming through the bush. But this is a breeding herd we have spent quite a bit of time with in the past. I recognize the matriarchal female. And there she is there. And very relaxed herd. Almost stopped to listen to what we were saying. So the bush is quite thick here, but we can hear elephants all around us. And we look, there comes one of the bulls. Look at that. So a little bit of good guesswork about where the ellies were going to come out. And then as soon as we found this breeding herd, pretty certain that the bulls were going to come through. Nice shot, Andrew. So not the floppy-eared one and not the big tusked one, but there were four or five little bulls. getting a little bit of playfulness here. There comes another cow in front of us. So it's very important with elephant breeding herds in initially to just watch them. We watched them for quite a while while you guys were with Jamie and we saw the, from their body language that they were relaxed in our presence. They didn't mind us being here. Here comes that bull. And he's got a broken right tusk. So quite often these younger bulls, and even the big bulls when they are ready to mate and in must, will trail these breeding herds. And sometimes the breeding herds can get quite, a, quite sort of disturbed by, by being followed constantly by these bulls and all the testosterone that comes with it. And they tend to harass them. So they quite often will try and move away. Hello, mister. So he looks to be about the same age, maybe actually a bit older than that very nice Tusker we saw earlier. Definitely bigger in the body size. Hello, mister. And as you'll see as he gets closer to the females, now I'd say he's over 30, so he's a nice big bull. You can see the body size. I mean, look at that. Height difference compared to an adult female there. Average female elephant will weigh around three tons. Look at that, throwing that dead stick to get to the grass underneath. And your average bull in this this area will weigh six tons. Here we go. You can look at you can literally see how he dwarfs the female. But look, the little one's having a little bit of a game there. Saying hello. Are you my dad? Sorry, guys, just going to be on the game drive radio for a second. Standing by. Oh, look at that. Isn't that cute? Look at that. So, it doesn't look like he's in must. He's not harassing them too much. So we're going to move again a little bit closer. I've been trying to watch to see if the other bulls, specifically that floppy bull, since we chatted about him so much earlier, might appear. But I'm not going to go crashing through the thick bush there. I think let's stick with these ellies and what we're hoping is that the rest of them come up and join the rest of the breeding herd. Digesting poisonous 
worm or larvae that they get from the bark of trees that they feed on. I have never heard that before, Steph, and, uh, and I don't think it is a temporary thing. Um, an elephant's ear is basically um, cartilage with a very tight and thin layer of skin over it. So I can't see how the cartilage would repair itself. So I think it actually has to be a physical damage. I think there can uh, also be vascular damage, so some sort of damage to the blood vessels that can cause a floppy air, but I, I don't think it's from poisoning by uh, a worm. I'm 99% certain of that, but I'm always happy to be proven wrong and learn something new every day. Okay, now they have chosen quite a difficult spot to get towards the road. Let's see if we can follow them. Of course, even though we can behave like an elephant sometimes, we're not as mobile through the bush as an elephant. wondering, will a mature cow tolerate the mating advances of a younger bull? Only if she's an estrus, Debbie, but normally you will find your big dominant bulls and your will only come into must. And those of you not sure what must is, must is a, a sort of a heightened hormonal phase uh, that elephants' bulls go through. So it's the equivalent of being on heat uh, or in estrus for a female. And with elephants, they will only mate when the, male, when the male is in must and the female is in estrus. So generally, the bigger, more dominant bulls will come into must when the most females are in estrus and your younger bulls will not. And, and you can imagine it must be quite a, a trying sort of first 25 to 30 years for an elephant bull. He reaches sexual maturity at around... 12 or 13 but can't mate till he's about 30 so very interesting and those those older bulls and bigger bulls will suppress must in the younger bulls until they're sort of old enough and big enough to to compete with those big bulls for those breeding positions sniffing uh, around her nether regions you might be testing for any sign of estrus even though she does have a young calf but I think it's unlikely it might be more just saying hello but sometimes these uh, for a lot of the elephant bulls life they will spend away from breeding herds and really only follow breeding herds when they're about to come into must or they sense that a female is in estrus even when they're not in must hello mister Welcome to a very cold place. Look at that, Mr. Moustache in Iceland. I'll get to your question in a second. You can see how that Ellie's just raised his trunk like that. He's actually smelling. And where he's facing now, he's actually smelling towards the females. He might be trying to smell urine uh, for testing for, for any estrus, if they might be coming into estrus. And he's decided to snack on now. So Mr. Moustache is saying, I mentioned that elephant tusks grow throughout their life and is wondering how big they can get. They can get massive and uh, it just depends on the individual. So the largest tusks ever recorded were reportedly shot uh, in the 1800s uh, by a slaver, a slave trader by the name of Tipo Tip on the, hello mister, on the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro. And it was then given as a gift. Look at this, he is so big. Was, those tusks were then given as a gift to the Sultan of Zanzibar. And so Zanzibar used to be a province of Oman. And the Sultan then gave them on to the British consulate 
or the British, uh, I suppose, uh, the British consulate in in Zanzibar, who then on when they hung outside the British consulate in Zanzibar for many years, before getting to their final resting place. Now, uh, where if you are ever in London, I really recommend going to have a look, uh, the British Museum of Natural History, and those tusks are over two meters long and weigh 240 odd pounds each so absolutely massive so he's gone behind us it almost looks like he might be going to have a look where the other bulls are so it's not uncommon that you get little bachelor groups there he's going right around us exactly where he's just come from and he's decided that there's no real need to be around those females no females about to be an estrus so he's back to the very important job of eating as much as possible a big ellie bull like, like that needs about 200 to 250 kilograms of veg vegetable matter in a day and is able to drink around 100 liters of water Safari Live, hello to Emma, who's five years old. Welcome on Safari with us, Emma. And Emma's wondering, do the Eddies miss playing in the water? I'm sure they do, Emma. And when they get the chance, they definitely will play in the water. They love spraying, spraying the mud on themselves to keep cool. He's moving away from the breeding herd again. So Emma, yes, I'm sure they do. And whenever they get a chance, they go for a swim, just like it. I'm sure you do when you get hot, you like to go for a swim and you miss it when you're hot and don't get to swim. So I'm sure the eddies do as well. So the elephants have moved off and fortunately still no sign of the floppy eared elephant. He might have changed direction slightly. There's a possibility that this bigger bull might be keeping that group of younger bulls at bay. So we're not going to go follow the herd off. I think it's time to go see what else we can find. Uh, hopefully there's lots out there this evening. If not, there's always absolutely wonderful and fascinating little things to look at. And we can always help you with your bird list. And uh, did you hear that, Andrew? Did you guys hear that? The elephant communication there. That low rumble. <laughs> And that can be heard for up to sort of 50 kilometers. And uh, a lot of an elephant's communication is on a frequency we can't hear. So m too low for us to hear. But when we do hear it, it's one of the best sounds in the bush. So I've been very fortunate. I've grown up in the bush my whole life. And uh, I remember once at a safari lodge in, in uh, Botswana, our guests came through from their first night out in the African bush. And they came up to have coffee, you walk, there we collect our guests and walk them to and from the rooms there's no fences and we have elephants and lions and, ele and hippo and buffalo in camp regularly so the one guest said to me you know i'm not going to believe it but there was a lion purring next to my tent all night uh, it wasn't a lion purring uh, lions can't purr i'm sure a lot of you out there know that because of their hyoid apparatus but it was the elephant rumbling so the elephants communicating with the other elephants in the area that wonderful sort of deep rumble and there's different tones that can be heard but it is a sound that really if I hear it at night it just sort of puts me to sleep and a big smile on my face well let's continue on Hope, hopefully we might be able to find that floppy ear a little bit later but while we move on see what else we can find out here let us go see what Jamie's up to on the other vehicle We have left the lionesses for now, but luckily there is another guide with them as we speak. So if they do get up, we'll go racing back to where we left them and follow them as they go about their evening business. Unfortunately, after all of those dark clouds rumbling in and promises of rain, I think we probably had about half a mil in total and it's breaking up already. No rain for us. You can see the blue skies starting to come through. And it's so 
it's quite dispiriting when you look across at the mountain views, which you can't see from here. And in fact, it's so hazy today that we can't really show you. But when you look across at the mountains and all you see is just rain falling down day after day around it and nothing coming in our direction. And apparently it was even raining in hood sprays this morning. And yet all we had were just one or two drops I'm not sure if Brent has mentioned, but we've even paid a visit by Peter the Pond Hippo, or at least the hippo that lives in the pond or in the pan. I'm not entirely sure whether, or, I don't think it's the same hippo. In fact, I'm fairly certain it isn't. Either way, a hippo came by to visit us to try and get to the green grass of the different, of a garden area. So the times have been tough on the animals and the plant life as well. The leaves are really already starting to droop almost completely. Well, that's wonderful news. So two days ago, Scott was on camera and we were sitting with Tingana, who wasn't feeling very well and wasn't feeling up to very much. And so we had quite an extensive discussion. That's not a good sound, is it? it seems okay. A bit, of a bit of a funny sound coming from Rusty. Might just be a plant stuck in one of the turning bits of the wheels. or not. It's, um, let me just have a look at these Impala quickly. I'm gonna hop out of the vehicle while we do on, that, on the other side of them and just double check what's creaking and groaning. Give me one second. Might just be a stuck leaf or branch. Can't see anything obvious. Hmm. Well, we'll have to just play it by ear, quite literally, in this case. Should be fine. I don't think we went through any extreme off roading, just a couple of bumps and a couple of monkey oranges to get to those lionesses. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I had to abandon Brian, so he didn't have much to show you there while I double-checked underneath the vehicle. <laughs> the Impala immediately moved off the minute I tried to... I tried to give you something more interesting to look at than the front of the car. Unfortunately, it didn't quite play out that way. Well, I'll just carry on and see how we go. It's okay, Rusty. I think it is something loose in the wheel. And I think with my lapel mic, you can't quite hear how serious it sounds, but it does sound incredibly uncomfortable. Let's try reversing and see if that dislodges whatever it is. Sometimes that helps. Voila! And while we look at, come on little, come on little Kohan. A little red crested Kohan running across the road in front of us. And it's a bird that's quite shy. So it might even be a new one for new viewers to add to your ever growing bird lists. Slightly smaller than the black bellied bustard. Here we go. But with a very similar body shape and coloration. Hey, we still see you. You think we don't, but we do. We haven't been lucky enough to catch the displays of these birds, the mating displays on camera, at least I haven't personally, where they, oh. <laughs> Watching a, it watched a European roller fly past there. That was what attracted its attention. Sorry, buddy. You will never be as blue as the European roller. <laughs> You'll never be quite as interestingly coloured, but you come with your own personal beauty. 
but yes, a red crested corhorn, one that flies straight up into the air and then drops its wings and tumbles out of the sky until at the last minute it breaks, this, breaks its fall with wild flapping. Fascinating to see, to see, and I wish I could have been able to show it to you live. You never know, we might just be reaching the end of their breeding season. But it's what gives them the name of the suicide bird. And the higher they fly up before falling, and the longer they leave it before breaking their fall with those flapping of their wings, the more attractive the females find it for some bizarre reason. Can we tell if it's the male? Or... The sillier the antics, the more attractive the male it appears to be. Now, in terms of judging the sex, I'm struggling to see exactly. My suspicion is that it is a male, but I'm just going to show you because you can sort of see on the bird itself as it starts to wander off. Where are we? Actually, sorry, I was mistaken. I think that might have been a female. It didn't have enough gray on it. So I was just double checking to see the dimorphism. In that case, I think we might have been watching a female with a fairly standard uh, color to its neck. Whereas the male has a slightly bluer crest to the top of the head and then that nice blue or gray neck. And the reason it's called a red-crested corhorn, something I haven't seen all that often, actually, or been fortunate enough to see that often, is that red crest that they display during their mating season in between displays of stupidity as they tumble out of the sky. One of those fascinating things to see, also known as the suicide bird. And it does. Annie, who's watching in Durban, Annie's got it absolutely right. It does actually look in a way like a little miniature spotted ostrich, or at least like a baby ostrich, which is the baby ostriches are cryptically colored like that. And Brian and, my, Brian and I said we were going to be sitting out to find ostrich this afternoon, somewhat jokingly, because we've yet to encounter one, although it has happened on the live drives. Well, there we go, Brian. We've got a bird that kind of looks like a baby ostrich. I'm about to fall out of my door because I didn't shut it properly after I checked it. Luckily, the sound appears to have disappeared and Rusty is back up and functioning as she should be. So I guess it was just a branch trapped somewhere in the spokes of the wheel or something around the axle. Seems fine now. I was in the process of talking before we were interrupted by the sounds coming from Rusty. I was in the process of chatting a bit about the conversation we had about food. And apparently, Diana from Connecticut, you were so involved and so enjoying our conversation that you actually went and looked up the recipes for both Malva pudding and bunny chow. So the conversation revolved around traditional South African foods. You were saying that they look absolutely delicious. Now, personally, I'm not a Malva pudding, Malva pudding fan, but that's something that apparently is quite unique to me. I don't know what it is. I just personally don't like it. My dad absolutely loves it. Nikki says that she's a huge fan. How do you feel about Malva pudding, Brian? I'm quite impartial to Malva pudding. Okay, well, there we go. There we go. So Brian's, Brian's on the, he does like, does enjoy. I will eat it if, I will eat it on occasion, but I certainly wouldn't choose to myself, but I am very much in the minority in that particular score. Now, bunny chow, bunny chow I am absolutely all for. Bunny chow is a type of curry made within half a loaf of bread. Essentially, you hollow out the loaf of bread and it can be chicken or beef or mutton or vegetable, whatever you particular preference you might have. And of course, Durban famed, which is where Mary's Mary comes from, who is asking, saying if that bird looks like an ostrich. And Durban, oh sorry, Annie, Annie was saying, who comes from Durban, she was, that is the curry capital of South Africa. And I've had some immensely wonderful curries from that particular side of the country. Already with just that little bit of sunshine breaking through, the temperatures have gone up astronomically.
we've got Miss Jacobs class and Jenna watching from Miss Jacobs class in Illinois. And you would like to know, oh, come back, Ma. We've had so many amazing moths recently. So Jenna would like to know, what does it take to become a field guide or to become a guide? And the answer is, there's a little bit of training, quite a bit of training involved, and different people have taken different routes, but all in all, the most important thing about what it takes to be a field guide is a love and a passion and an interest in the places that you get to see, in the wild areas that you get to travel in. Because as soon as you've got that passion and that interest, everything else becomes easy. Everything that is hard work, and it is hard work being a guide, there's nothing easy in life, but it is something that is unbelievably rewarding. And as soon as you've got that fascination for what you're seeing and what you're learning about, you immediately, everything else is, learning becomes easy, it becomes quick. St things that you've learned stick in your mind because you're fascinated by them. The more you see, the more you learn. And you'll find that if you're constantly learning in that way, you're never bored with what you're doing. So that to me is what makes a per or what leads to somebody being a good guide. And then there's other sort of the necessary factors. So you've got to do your first aid course and you've got to refresh that every year or every couple of years. And that's because you're dealing with guests and you're responsible for them on a day-to-day -day basis. You're responsible for visitors to the country. And you've got to, in certain areas, you've got to have special driver's licenses. So you do a special driver's test. And it's more just a public or a professional driver's permit. And then yes, the training, the most important part as well as being a guide is how much you learn in the time that you are gaining experience. And I think through no fault of anybody, I had an incredible training experience, but I still feel as though I learned more in my first week of guiding or my first month of guiding than I did during the entire training course, just because you're learning on the go. And it's important because Every guide is sort of takes upon it, takes it upon themselves to further their training, and it's something that never stops. You never stop learning to become a guide. we loop around along Treehouse Dam and I'm actually quite disappointed as I've arrived here because it looks to me to be completely dry and Max T who I think is a new viewer certainly new to asking questions I haven't heard your name before on the live safari you were wondering if during this time of drought if it is something that happens every year better watch the damn wall while I drive across it whether it's something that happens every year or is this something exceptional every few years sorry if it's something that happens every few years and the answer is yes we do get periodic droughts they do happen it is one of those naturally occurring events and for nice big open systems it is a way of weeding out the strong from the weak and essentially it's all part of natural weather patterns whether or not that has been exacerbated by climate change is up for you to see exactly how you view it but either way droughts would have been naturally occurring fires are a naturally occurring part as are floods and floods are equally destructive as droughts can be they can cause just as much damage just over a shorter time span than perhaps a drought might well, the one thing about this drought is it has been quite an extensive one as far as i know it's the worst of its kind since at least 1998 if not longer depending on how long it goes on and at this time of year the grass should be knee high waist high in places the dams should be full to the point of bursting or overflowing it's definitely tough to see and it's fine we're very fortunate in the area that we are currently traversing on the animals within here have got an enormous amount of space close to about four million hectares of wild unfenced land that they are more than welcome and completely free to go wandering through 
which means they have access to the big river systems, they have access to the more resilient parts of the world. Uh, for the farmers and for the smaller reserves where they are fenced, it becomes a slightly different story. And it be the drought impacts a little bit more on the way that they operate. The one thing we are fortunate to have is the tree life or the woodland life because the trees with their roots are capable of accessing the underground water resources that the grasses are unable to reach and the animals are unable to reach. And in the end, it will be the, the giant trees that start to see through some of the larger mammal species for the next few months. And while we go off in search of the animals that will be eating the trees, let's find out what Brent's been up to. Welcome, and we are now perusing the western sector of Juma Private Game Reserve, seeing what we can find. Now, we had a little bit of rain last night, so we are cruising along what is called a seat line. And it is where water comes down from the top of the crest of the hills and seeps down towards where a riverbed or stream bed would start. And you can see it's lovely and green, and this very short grass all around us is favored by a lot of animals. It's a really good place to start looking for some animals. And I did see some giraffe tracks heading in this direction, as well as some zebra tracks. So we're gonna keep looking. Oh, look at that. You can hear him calling. I'm just gonna try to get us into a gap. This is actually a favorite spot of this particular bird. I've seen him here a few times. It is a male black-bellied blast busted. And apparently you've just seen a red-crested Quran with Jamie. So this is a slightly bigger version. And you can see that wonderful black belly that it, he gets his name from. And they're quite striking. So he's busy sitting up there looking for ladies. And I'm hoping he's gonna do his call shortly. And that's how I initially found him, I heard it very distinct and uh, I do know a friend of mine who used to work with in the lodge industry uh, who was more on the food and beverage side used to say it was a champagne bird because when it calls it does a little pop there we go on cue so a little champagne cork popping there so that call is to attract any female that might be around. That's why he's sitting on top of a termite mound, so a bit higher up, and trying to attract the attention of any ladies. But unfortunately for this guy, I don't think we've seen a lady with him once this, this year. decided it's time for a little snack. Oh, I think get ready for another call. There we go, isn't that wonderful? So we Having a look here, this is a black-bellied bustard. It looks very similar to the red-crested crown. It is quite a bit bigger, but that black belly extends all the way up the throat where red-crested crown's black stops on its belly. So we're gonna leave him to continue looking for ladies. Uh, we don't want to affect his chances by hanging around, even though we wouldn't. And he almost looks like he's getting a bit shy in our presence. So hopefully we are going to come past here on one of the safaris and find him with a lady friend. Till then, I'm sure he will keep popping away on top of that termite mound and in this general area. He's also chosen this area. They do like these short grass areas. I was talking about the seat line. Uh, also being a ground dwelling bird, he's got good visibility to protect him from predators, as well as good visibility for a lady to find him. Now the red crested Quran tends to live in slightly thicker bush, 
And so when a red crested crowned male needs to find a lady, he's got a far more intricate display. He will literally fly directly up into the air so it can be seen for quite a long way around, close his wings and plummet to earth and open his wings just before uh, he becomes sort of a, a terminal case. And as that has led to their nickname uh, being the suicide bird. going through an incredibly dry time and we've had probably about 50% of the rain we would have normally had at this time of the year. So Andy and Julia in Los Angeles are wondering are there any animals that thrive in drought? Yes, most definitely the predators. Lion, leopard, hyena, wild dog, cheetah. The lion in particular during really bad droughts, lion popula populations in this area have been known to increase by 10 to 15% in a very short time. So very, very interesting that the predators, this is a time of plenty for them. And for our regular viewers, that's really good news for Karula, who's just had cubs. And hopefully, they'll being in the drought, she's going to have a really successful hunting season. Now, I just spotted something here. And I really love wildflowers. And with this drought, I haven't had an opportunity to show you very many uh, this, this wet season, although it's a very dry, wet season. So we've got a few here. Some of them are really small and really delicate. And another one is quite a nice one and important for us. And I've, oh, Andrew, I don't know if you're gonna be able to get it. You see that black fly there? Oh, he's gone. Did you get him at all? No. Oh, unfortunately, so. there's an incredible little insect with black, uh, 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 almost velvet with a long proboscis. It's proboscis, if those of you not know, proboscis is like his mouth parts that he uses to actually put inside flowers like this was about three times the length of his body. So he was a fly about this big, but his, his mouth parts were really, really long. Sorry, I'm just gonna collect the last of my little goodies out here. And where is that one I saw? Hasn't opened flowers yet, but this one. So I'm going to take the opportunity to show you a few because we really haven't seen many this year. So this is a really, really pretty little flower. And you can see very white on the outside, but pinkish, almost pinkish purplish if I turn it to face the other way. On the underside, beautiful little, almost sort of lilac color. And that is a really cool little flower. It's called an Oldenlandia. And it is a heliotrope. Now, a heliotrope is a very specific type of flower. There's many different flowers that are heliotropes, uh, and they look incredibly different. So the most well-known heliotrope uh, that everyone out there would know would be a sunflower. So what it does, say, my hand is the sun, and as, my, as the sun moves through the sky, the flower will actually turn to face it, so to get the maximum amount of sun in a day. Isn't that incredible? A little heliotrope called Oldenlandia. And the next one is uh, one we've seen quite a few of the butterflies, another one of my favorite things that are not too prolific this year, and it's a little yellow justitia. And, uh, there's a village on the border of the Sabi Sands that is named after this flower. We get a couple of different types of justitias. This is the only one I've seen so far this year, but I will keep looking for the felt justitia, which is my favorite, which is very similar to like this, except it's white with purple polka dots. Now, this one's not so much of a flower, but you'll notice after that little bit of rain, I've been slapping myself quite frequently, and that's due to a lot of the flies that have come. And we used this when there were a lot more flies quite effectively. I'm going to give some to Andrew because I know how much he doesn't like flies. Um, as a natural insect repellent, and it's a dwarf wild sage. Beautiful smell. So not only does it keep the bugs away from me, it's my uh, cologne for the evening. Hopefully Jamie will be quite impressed with it. 
uh, and hopefully doesn't chase me out of bed. Oh, and see, I'm already in trouble. See, I should have been picking the flowers for Jamie. Uh, and then lastly, but not least, now I'm gonna make Andrew eat this one. I know this one. Ah, Andrew says he knows this one. I think he thinks he knows this one, but it might not be the one he thinks he knows. I think Andrew thinks this is wild basil, oh, but it's not. It. <laughs> so it looks exactly the same as wild basil, but this is wild aniseed. So incredible licorice smell, and uh, I mean, really, really tastes like licorice sweet. It's, it's incredible how close it is. Andrew mm, doesn't. Licorice Andrew doesn't like licorice. I That's, do like. No, oh, you do like licorice. Uh, I know it's Brian who doesn't like licorice, and I made Brian eat it last time. But and uh, really good if you're cooking. Uh, you can cook with this and wild basil. But one of the favourite things I want to see how close you can get, you, Andrew, is it's got the most beautiful, delicate little flowers. Mm, you're too close. Too close. There. A little bit more. There we go. And you see that beautiful purple incredibly tiny and delicate flowers so there we go wild aniseed and really good um, on on pork rub it into the skin with lots of rock salt so great little thing to collect uh, when it's around uh, for the for the, the herb kitchen back at home unfortunately you can't they're very difficult to grow uh, and they only come out for a few months of the year during the rainy season and you can't actually grow them for the full year so only a, you can dry them and keep them, of course, but to keep them green and fresh is very, very difficult. Uh, wild basil, on the other hand, literally grows like a weed. So let's continue on. So Steph uh, has started keeping a wild flower list while well Van Steph. So she only started last week and she's wondering about the Oldenlandia, the beautiful little white and purple flower. Uh, how do I spell it? It's O-L-D-E-N-L-A-N-D-I-A. Oldenlandia. A wonderful little flower. And we're gonna jump across to Jamie, uh, who we were speaking about pork. Uh, she's got some that isn't in the cooking pot. A nice to see after Tingana's pork breakfast of yesterday morning. It really is quite a pleasure to see two young, healthy looking piglets with their mother, who I must say doesn't look nearly as healthy as they do. We've seen this warthog female before. She's quite a big lady. Her tusks are quite large. She lives around the Redwood, uh, Twin Dam's Leadwood Road. But she really doesn't look all that healthy. But just look while we've got this incredible view. <laughs> I love watching the way their snouts work while they feed on their hocks or their ankles. But you can have a look at the tusks that we so often speak about, the lower tusks. And those are the really sharp, dangerous weapons. It's not the top set of tusks that you've got to watch out for. It's those razor-sharp bottom ones growing out of their bottom jaw that constantly sharpen themselves by rubbing against the top lip or the top tusks. <laughs> not often we get to enjoy such an awesome sighting. And I'm actually going to start keeping my voice down because they seem to almost be thinking about wandering across to us. She's got one little boy piglet and one little girl. And how do you tell the difference? Well, the best way is to look at the warts on their faces, those little knobbly protrusions. In females, they only have two. In males, they have four. So there you go, perfect. One on the left, oh, no, don't go away. Okay, go away then. <laughs> this little one that we're looking at now is a male with his four warts, two on each side of his face, one underneath his eyes and one by his nose. And they're even starting to get the bulge. Yes, come on, Mom, it's all right, you can come here. You can come through. Oh, it's such a pleasure to enjoy a warthog sighting like this. It's not often that we get to have, have a sighting. The warthog here tend to be 
quite skittish, although they've relaxed more and more, I've noticed, over recent months. And we've even got to see these little ones, already at a couple of months old, imitating the behavior of the adults sitting on their elbows, or well, their wrists is more accurate, and feeding just like mom. And she's done very well to keep her two youngsters safe. What's she got there? It looks like she's got a poison bulb or something similar. No, she's eating bones. Awesome. How cool is that? It's a rib bone. Can you hear the crunching? What's mommy got, little piglet? What's she doing? I bet that might be something new for you. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is known as osteophagy. And it's the process of eating bones, or more likely, or more generally, chewing on bones. Oh, little piglets want some too, Mom. They also want it. And she's after the calcium within the rib itself. Very, very common to see, particularly with warthogs and giraffe, for some reason. And her baby's curious as to what on earth Mom was. So we've just got a request, and an unusual request from Kat, for a red star zena, which is a flower we get here. But it's a bad flower, Kat. It is an exotic species, uh, and it is from South America. And it was brought out as an ornamental garden plant, and has literally spread to disturbed areas all over the African bushveld in South Africa. So the one really big positive about this incredibly dry weather we're having is it will definitely give a good whack to the Red Star Zena population. So I am on my way to find you one right this second, Cat. But before we get there... Oh, it's going to disappear. Tiny little guy, little female, Stenbocky. And that is... And there's someone coming down the road. Let's try and get out of their way. This is the main access road. In and out of the Starby Sands. Ah. Hello, hello, hello. It's Vernon, the general manager of Arethusa Safari Lodge. So while we head towards the Red Star Zena, especially for you, Kat, uh, let's jump back on with Jamie, who seems to have sorted out her gremlin. Well, that was a magical experience, and I'm sorry that the camera had a little bit of a malfunction while we were with the warthog. <laughs> the one suddenly realized that mom was quite far away and fluffed up its little mohawk, making itself, the little boy, making itself look so big and scary. Having investigated mom's rib bone and decided that it didn't look all that appealing, but yes, just to finish up, a way of supplementing their diets with calcium and phosphorus that they get from chewing on the old bones. So that was what mom was up to. She's moved off. She's finished with her bone chewing experience. And I don't think, I think this must be a first for, unless I'm completely incorrect, I'm not sure how many of you have seen warthogs chewing on bones on the live safari. You have seen it with giraffe, apparently, and I'm sure I've seen it with Inyala before on one of our live drives, but I've certainly a first for me to put it on camera. The warthog chomping away on a rib bone. And Lynn, you've been enjoying this close-up sighting of the warthog as well. It's not often that we get to see them like this. But you were wondering if she's missing hair on her back. And yes, I think that she is. Usually the warthogs do have slightly more hair. It is sparse, but slightly more hair that runs down in a tuft from their mane down their backs. Another way of making themselves look big and scary. She does appear to have some kind of, some kind of bald patch, whether it's from a skin disease or whether it's from an old injury, which has scarred up and then left a bald patch, I'm not entirely sure. 
I think it could be connected to the reason behind her condition or lack thereof. She is looking thin, not the healthiest warthog I've ever seen, but still doing an excellent job of raising two healthy piglets in a very, very difficult environment. And warthogs are particularly sensitive, not necessarily just to drought, although they do have to concentrate very hard on providing the nutrients that they need but also to changes in climate. Sudden drops of temperature, sudden extremes of temperature, very often do quite serious damage to piglet population. You better go, guys. Mom's getting very far away from you. I'm gonna stay with Mom. There's hungry leopards. And Miss Lobo Bob, you were wondering whether, <laughs> I love their little mohawks, I think that spells the end of our wonderful warthog sighting. But Miss Lobo Bob was wondering, do warthogs eat and digest bones like hyenas do? And the answer is no, they don't. Generally, it's quite a, it's quite a short sighting or quite a short process where they nibble a bit around the ribs. I've seen giraffe with larger bones chew for a long time, but all they're really doing is scraping off the fine fragments of the bone. They're not properly crunching to get into the bone marrow in the same way that hyenas can do. Their skulls aren't really built for the same crushing power and their teeth aren't structured for the same crushing power that hyena have but they do absolutely eat or nibble on bones, but it's not to the same extent in the way that hyenas are built for digesting and crushing bone. <clears throat> and it's something that you'll see as I attempt to start Rusty and we'll carry on talking. It's something, as I said, that you'll see in all antelope species, as well as warthogs and any kind of prey animal, something that is purely herbivore based. What's interesting about warthog and common dacre or grey dacre, we've spoken about it before. Uh, you'll notice I'm just ever so slightly... Oh, I heard a click, I heard a click. Hey. There's a trick to it, I'm learning it. I'm not quite sure what the trick is except sheer persistence, but I am learning. But yes, warthogs, dacre and bush pig. As animals that are predominantly herbivores, they do occasionally like to nibble on not just bones, but also carcasses. And of course, this entire area for them is littered with the remains of what I assume was either a, a large antelope or a buffalo, probably a buffalo. And probably back in the days with the matimbas and the sticks would be my guess that this kill came from. Bones scattered all over the show. Before the arrival of the Birmingham boys, this was the area that we used to see the sticks pride in, around twin dams. Ouch, something just bit me. I think it was an ant. I think an ant just bit me. But Valerie means, you were wondering, speaking about animals that utilize bones and hyenas, you were wondering if we were going to go to the hyena den. I'm still deciding, to be honest, Valerie. I would very much love to go to the hyena den. However, this evening, Brian and myself will be rushing back to camp to fetch the camera that we're going to try and experiment with. And it's essentially a camera built for low light conditions. So at around quarter past six, we're gonna dash we're going to reattach the camera and we're going to head out again. And then it becomes a decision as to whether or not we go to the hyena den or if we go to those lionesses because those lionesses are going to be thinking about hunting and it's the perfect evening for it. So once things start to get cooler and when we have that camera, just imagine how exciting that will be in a situation where, for example, we aren't able to use the spotlight and I think it was actually a velvet ant because it's now starting to sting. And I thought I saw it running away, so it was a wasp, it wasn't an ant. Um, <laughs> but yes, it just becomes a matter of, because sometimes we can't, in the middle of a hunt, we can't shine a spotlight. But with this camera, we might be able to see a little bit more in the way of detail during those time periods. So I'm still debating, it depends on what happens with those lines in the next hour or so. 
I, I know that Brent has suggested heading across to the Lions as well. And we'll have to, honestly, you'll just have to stay tuned and see because if Brent tells me and calls me and says that they're up and about and they're hunting, then probably both of us will head across to that sighting to try and stay with them. Uh -huh. of our description of the different types of South African foods. Pat, you were wondering if it's buddy chow, as in chow you have with your friends, or is it bunny chow? And it's bunny. Bunny is in the little thing that hops around and has the big ears, but not actually made of bunny, just to clarify. It's not actually made of bunny. But yes, it is bunny chow, Pat, bunny chow. My apologies for the South African accent and its occasional lack of distinction between consonants and vowels. Anyway, I just wanted to give you that update. I'm gonna send you back up across to Brent. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to send you back across to Brent and find out what he's up to. So a lot of you have been watching for a long time will remember when we've had really good rains. Quarantine has been literally covered in an exotic flower, which Kat especially asked me to find. So there we go, Kat in Tampa, just for you. That is what you call a red star zena. Now, it is exotic, and it is an invasive plant, and it actually causes quite a lot of problems. The fact is that literally nothing eats it. So often it's a big problem, and it stops the grass and other natural plants growing. So there are different ways to eradicate it, but it is a very hardy plant. But this drought that we're having at the moment should keep it at bay or at least bring the numbers down before the next rainy season. They like lots of water. There we go. And because of this drought, they're only really growing in two places and we just happen to be quite close to one, so we popped in there for you, Kat. But anyway, there we go, Red Star Zena. There we go, Andrew, you can put a flower behind your ear. first and we'll catch up oh big game going on round and round and round and it is the impala there you go setting them off let's try to get a bit closer so often overlooked on safari but probably one of the most important animals out here in the african bush it is the most numerous antelope south of the sahara not that there's many antelope north of the Sahara, to be honest. Let's just try to get you in a good spot here, guys. And definitely one of the more fascinating creatures we get out here. 
about that little one. So we've got a little crash in front of us. So we're going to just chat about these Impala for a little bit, and we've got a really interesting question from Mercedes, which we, we will get into, but it's going to be quite a lengthy uh, answer. So Mercedes, I'm just going to chat about these Impala while we've got them right next to us here. So as I was saying, probably the, the most commonly seen animal on safari and often the most overlooked animal, but they fill a, such a special place in the trophic level. So they are able to graze, as we can see, perfect example there the two little guys on the on the left right and center of screen are eating grass and the one behind to the left is eating a tree so they're one of the few animals that is both a browser and a grazer so enabled to take advantage of both of the main food types here depending on the situation so they often survive droughts and things in better numbers than the other animals and their ad ad adaptability, oh, sorry about that, adaptability is what has made them so successful. So successful, in fact, that they have not changed. They have not evolved further for about 1.6 million years. So if you had to term survival as success, the impala is a far more successful species than the human being who's only been around in its current form for about 150 to 200,000 years. And apart from being that, filling that important, well, the mo one of the most important niches they fill in the, in the ecosystem is dinner. So they are eaten by most of your large predators, and in certain areas, even some of your small predators will take advantage of impala. But they are incredible animals. This, this group here is probably about 40 or 50 spread out. So we saw those impala dashing away when we arrived and Ginny in New Jersey is wondering how fast can they run. Probably up to, I'm, I know you guys in the States work in miles and it is just really difficult for me to do the conversions, uh, but they get up to about 80 kilometers an hour, so really, really fast. Uh, they can't keep it up for too long, but they can generally keep that up a lot longer than a lion can, for say. So leopard and lion, your ambush predators, even though they're incredibly quick over that initial burst, if an impala manages to get that little bit further, it'll escape. So that's why they have to be quite close when they decide to pounce but the biggest threat to an impala. And those of you who've been watching safaris will often have seen if we're following a leopard and a leopard spots the impala, or the impala, they don't disappear into the bush once they've spotted it. They know that that element of surprise is gone and they'll sort of walk up to it going, pff, 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 I see you. And when they see a wild dog, they don't even alarm call, they just run. Wild dogs can do sort of 70, 80 kilometers an hour, but keep it up to four, for four and a half kilometers or so. So they're really, a really huge threat to Impala. So there we go, about 50 miles an hour. Thanks very much, Nikki and Final Control for doing the maths for me. And now we're going to leave these little impalas and see what else is out and about. And while we do that, we're going to discuss a really interesting question from Mercedes. So Mercedes said, notice that I'd said I've grown up in the bush. I've literally lived, um, I think I've spent one year of my life permanently in a city. Uh, and that was probably the worst year of my life. The rest of it, I've lived in the bush or on game farms. And from various different countries in uh, South Africa, Botswana, uh, on an island in Namibia, and in the middle of the Zambezi Valley in Tanzania, uh, Gabon. So I've done my fair share of living in the wild places. And Mercedes is wondering, do I see a, a reduction in the, the, the 
total populations of animals uh, since I've been in the bush that long. Well, strangely enough, in cities in South Africa, there are actually more wild animals now than there were when I was sort of five or six years old. So a lot of cattle farms and our game farms and a lot of cattle farms have been opened up and different landowners have joined together to make an even bigger game farm or wildlife reserve. So definitely more animals. I would say in your big systems like the Kruger, uh, I know for a fact there's a lot more elephants than there were. Uh, that's also the fact that the Kruger has opened up to these areas like the Sabi Sands, the Timbavati, and the formation of that incredibly large Transfrontier Park with uh, Zimbabwe and Mozambique. So I would say in South Africa, there are more animals. In other places in Africa, there are less, and it all depends on the individual area and what's happening there. Uh, tourism has played a very important role in that. And the other question, which is sort of linked, is like, well, how do people get permission to collar animals? get permission to collar the animals we see here in the Sabi Sands. Well, first we say is we do occasionally see collared animals in the Sabi Sands, and two collared animals I've seen, well, buffalo the most frequently is one collared animal we see, and I have seen a few collared elephants. And now, how do you get permission to collar an animal? Uh, you actually have to have quite a good reason, especially in an area like this that is open to the Kruger. There has to be a, a, a sort of a proper scientific research going on. So those buffalo are, are collared for the monitor, monitoring of bovine tuberculosis uh, and also for the movement of animals to and from the park and out. Elephants, I know there's quite a lot of study in Kruger going on on elephant herd movements, how far they move, etc. And that's what the elephant collars were for. So in terms of lions and leopards in the Saudi science, don't have any collared individuals. There may, I think I've seen one collared lion in my time in the Cyber Sands, and that came from Kruger. But as I said, to get permission to collar, there needs to be a significant, strong reason uh, with a lot of scientific backing to why to collar. Now, in other places in Africa, specifically where there's a lot of predator uh, human conflict, you will find a lot of collared predators. And there's ongoing research on how to minimize the conflict between human beings and lions and leopards and hyenas. So that's the main reason to collar a predator. And all collared animals, as I said, there has to be a really good scientific argument behind the reason for collaring an animal. Uh, I hope that helps, Mercedes. Uh, if you're wondering a little bit more, want a little bit more in detail, just pop the question through again in a little bit more detail and I'll see if I can help. And for those of you who might have just joined us and you're wondering how Mercedes got a question to me, you can pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv if you're wondering anything about what we're seeing or the African bush in general. Uh, or you can pop a question out on Twitter and all you do is just hashtag Safari Live and it should get to get through to our ladies in final control. Uh, we do try to answer as many of your questions as possible and we do apologize if your question doesn't get answered on the drive, but keep trying to send them and we will try to get to everyone's questions. who's chosen to use the hashtag of Safari Live and get hold of us by Twitter is wondering how the social hierarchy of an impala herd works. So when it's decided to move or whatnot, is it the ram, is it the female? Now, impalas have quite an interesting sort of social structure. So for a lot of the year, they're non-territorial. Uh, and the males don't really bother too much defending the females against other males. But come March, mating season's on, and they become highly territorial. I think with Impala, there's no real decision to move on when they're fed through an area, they'll just keep moving and keep feeding. I've often seen females or males leading, so actually it's a really good question, Risha, and I can't give you a definitive answer on it, but I would say it's just sort of a general movement as they continue. a leopard-like termite mound, I apologize, but it's always good at checking those out. I got very excited for a second there. So I'm just going to get a hold of Jamie on the Game Drive Radio to find out what her plan is. And here 
says another member of Africa's Big Five we actually haven't seen that and will spend too much time with on this sunset safari. I'm not sure if Jamie has seen one. There we go. An old buffalo bull. Let's get a little bit closer to him while I chat to Jamie. Jamie, Jamie. Jamie, what's your plan? Thanks very much. I'll start slowly making my way there. Ah, and look, there's the gentleman who gave me a very hard time this morning. So Jamie and I had our morning off and we had a little bit of a sleep in, which for us means we got up at about six o'clock. And uh, I sort of looked out of bed, out the, the front door, and I sort of saw a large grey shape moving past is not supposed to be a large grey shape in our garden and I know Jamie told you a little bit, a little bit about it but the hippo tried to climb in the swimming pool uh, three or four times and we had to stand there and sort of, hey stop it stop it and unfortunately once the hippo is in the swimming pool it's very difficult to get out but that does show you how dry it is at the moment and these young hippo bulls or old hippo bulls uh, are the first to be pushed out of the limited water and that is why he's sitting in the pan which is obviously not an ideal spot if you're a hippo let's see if we can get a good view from above very big safari live and a very fat hippo welcome to a little flower girl on youtube who says she's new to this stuff well welcome little flower girl and i can as you can see we're looking at a big fat hippo uh, who's grazing at the moment and you can ask us questions about what we're seeing uh, we're on a live african safari so please feel free to ask us any questions and you can join us twice a day for these safaris and get you a little bit of a a little bit of an Africa fix. One of my favorite quotes, and it's one that I use at the bottom of all my emails. It is if you ever visit a continent, no, if you ever visit a continent, if you ever visit two continents in your life, visit Africa twice. Let's go forward a bit. We might be able to get a little bit of a better view. This thought it'd be quite nice and interesting for Andrew to frame it between the two knob forms. So normally a hippo wouldn't be out of the water as much as this guy is. The fact that he's got very little water and there's very little good grazing for him close by. And he, he is eating weeds at the moment. Uh, and some of that basil, he's eating some of the stuff we were looking for earlier. Hello, mister. You can see he's not in the greatest condition and it's forcing him out to feed at this time of the day. I'm trying to see whether he's a young male or an old male. And it's sometimes quite difficult with these guys who are lacking a bit of form. We can see the teeth. Judging from his teeth, he might be an older male. So now that we're in a drought, there's very limited spots of deep water left. So the sort of fit dominant males will chase these old boys and the young boys out. And they are forced to sort of fight for themselves and find any little bit of water and this is a, such an incredible view and not a view of you get from a hippo too often out the water from the top of the very dry Juma Dam wall so this is an incredibly massive animal so well over a thousand kilograms. So much bigger than that buffalo bull. And especially with this drought and this hippo being around our living areas, we've got to be very, very careful. Now, 
hippos kill more people than any other mammal in Africa. And it's quite often when they come around human habitation in search of grazing. You can see he's got some quite serious, or well, there were quite serious wounds there that the oxpeckers are busy feeding off, getting, digging out and feeding off the fresh blood. Look at that, you can see the red of the oxpecker's beak disappears into the red of the hippo's flesh. This is definitely one of the better hippo sightings I've ever had since I've been at Safari Live, sitting way up on the wall looking down on this monstrous animal. And if anyone's on the Juma cam, you'll be able to see how big this animal is in comparison to us. So the hippo is probably about the length of the vehicle, but probably weighs about the same as this Land Rover that we're in as well. And you can see he doesn't use his teeth to graze, he uses his lips to pluck. So very tough lips and you can see those defined thick hairs on his nose. So he's using his lips to pull whatever plant he's trying to get at the moment. Oh no, I wouldn't eat that if I was you. Yes, good idea. Skip over that. That is castor weed and it's very, very vile and quite poisonous. Nick Jones is ecstatic. This is his first hippo on safari. Well, Nick, I'm glad I've been able to share this with you. This is definitely one of the best hippo views I've had in the last year. Now we can see very distinct four toes on a hippo. Now, seeing this hippo out of the water, and if we, it reminds me of a wonderful African folklore. And it's called when hippo was hairy. So you can see those big thick bristly hairs on his nose. So in that story when hippo was hairy, hippo was covered in a wonderful lush thick coat. But he used to get very hot wandering around the African savannah. He also used to be a predator. That's why he has those massive teeth. But he decided he got way too hot and he started begging the creator, uh, creator, please can I go live in the water? Please can I go live in the water? And creator said, no, hippo, you're too big, you're too fat, you'll eat all the fish. You are not allowed to live in the water. But eventually, after much nagging, the creator agreed to let hippo live in the water. But the conditions were hippo had to lose his luscious coat that he was very proud of, and he had to, on request, open his mouth to show his teeth, which Hippo do quite often as a display, to make sure the creator could see he had eaten no fish. So apart from losing his coat, he had to give up his carnivorous diet. He wasn't allowed to eat any of the fish or other animals that lived in the water. He had to swap to grass. He also has to spread his dung so the creator can see that he was not sneaking any fish. So the hippo spreads his dung so the creator can check that there are no fish bones in it. And he opens his mouth so the creator can see that there are no fish bones stuck between the hippo's teeth. So we're going to leave this big boy as he tries to find enough food to s sustain himself through this dry, dry period. Before we leave him, you can see those distinct puncture wounds that the oxpeckers are digging at. Uh, those are certainly from another hippo. All those scars on his back will have been fighting for a spot in the deep water, which he's now lost. So all those scars and wounds are from the big territorial battles that hippo bulls have throughout their life. So unfortunately, he hasn't been too victorious. 
So he's relegated to the tiny pan in front of the Juma cam and eking an existence out with there's very little for him to eat. But we're going to leave him be. We're going to start heading towards the lions. See, it's getting to that time of day when it's lion time. They might start getting up and moving and hunting. Fingers crossed. But while we do that, we're going to go, sorry, excuse me. We're off to see the largest carnivore in Africa. And Jamie's got the smallest member of the family. And the difference being, of course, as the evening draws to a close, Africa's largest carnivore is about to be up and about, whilst our smallest carnivore is about to be back in bed. And the dwarf mongoose are just finishing up their last little rounds of foraging on this beautiful evening before returning to their termite burrow. When we first came round the corner, there were about, I would say, at least seven or eight of them. Most of those have gone back in and have settled down for the evening. There's just a couple of remaining curious sentries keeping an eye on whatever we are up to. Hello, you lot. You can see how much larger the one in the front is compared to the one at the back. And I mean, that's all relative, of course, because they are incredibly tiny. To give you a rough sense of scale, they're not much bigger than the rats that you might find in your cities or gardens or towns. Only just a little bit larger. And yet one of the most fascinating little creatures that we get out here. Keeping an eye on us before bed. Hello. You are terribly cute. Now, usually dwarf mongoose groups in this sort of area average between about, I would say between about seven to about 15 individuals, all ruled over by the alpha breeding pair. So the alpha male and the alpha female, much like our most endangered carnivore, the African wild dog. Very, very similar social structure, despite, of course, occupying a completely different niche within their ecology. And these guys are fearsome predators, but they are fearsome predators of things like insects, millipedes, centipedes, scorpions, anything along those lines. And Raid Freak, absolutely. Amongst the list of their dietary requirements, included upon there are snakes. Raid Freak would like to know if they are snake catchers or snake eaters. Absolutely. Now, there's stories, of course, that of mongoose families or mongoose clans taking on huge cobras, particularly, I think, most of those stories stemming from India. That is not really all that likely, especially for a dwarf mongoose. A dwarf mongoose is not going to go after a two-meter cobra or a two-meter black mamba, although they may very courageously mob it if it seems as though it is threatening their youngsters. By mobbing, I mean gathering together in a group and hissing and spitting and squeaking and mock charging at the threatening snake. But anything smaller than that, something slightly less dangerous, an egg eater, perhaps, or a little centipede eater, or a blind snake, or a thread snake, all of those would fall under the heading of mongoose, dwarf mongoose snack. Not now, however, they're just enjoying the last few rays of warmth. Interesting how they are not the most fastidious of creatures. You can always tell a dwarf mongoose burrow when they're inhabiting a dwarf mongoose mound by the little droppings of dung that they leave all around the entrances and those are those spots that you can see up in the top above the mongoose's head. Surprisingly large feces or scat for something of that tiny little size. There you go, that's the dwarf mongoose scat there. Absolutely, Iggy. 
having spoken about their conflict with snakes, Iggy was watching all the way from Canada when we had probably the most extraordinary dwarf mongoose sighting of my life which was where we came across the dwarf mongoose family all alarm calling and there was a huge what looked like a spitting cobra either way it was an enormous snake unfortunately it disappeared very quickly before we could get a good identifying glimpse at it but what proceeded to occur was the best mongoose sighting i have ever had and it was probably a once in a lifetime experience for some of the viewers and for me as well quite possibly and that was the entire family some of whom have started emerging now. The entire, oh, little bit of a greeting there. The entire family proceeded to move five little babies from wherever the snake, the, the den was obviously too close for comfort, close to the snake. And they proceeded to move the entire family, the babies as well, to a new den site. And we watched them proceeding with these fairly large youngsters, I mean, compared to the body size of the adults, but they were still carrying them in their mouths. And there was rushing and squeaking and chaos. Really was one of the most incredible sightings I've ever had. Now, unfortunately, I do have to leave these dwarf mongoose now because we have to race back to camp to get the exciting new camera. And while we do that, just to finish up with that story, Eggie was wondering if I ever went to that new den site. And we saw them when they moved in, they were it was almost like they were celebrating a safe move. They were all playing around the entrance to the den. They were cheek rubbing their cheeks along the branches. They were scent marking, anal pasting, all clearly part of a new move. Iggy, I did go back and I didn't see any sign of the mongoose, but that could just have been because they were out foraging. Unfortunately, it's just one of those things. We might have missed them. Because I went back, I think it was about three or four days after that original sighting. So I was very curious to see what was happening there. But yes, definitely best sighting ever. We might lose you a bit through this dip, so just bear with me. This is where I saw Tingana the other day. She completely took me by surprise. Here we go, we seem to be high and dry. And yes, the mongoose sighting, probably the most incredible thing. And it just goes to show how you never know what you're going to see on a live safari. That to me was an absolute, I would say the, one of the highlights of the year, if I'm completely honest. That entire process, and we learned so much from it. Watching that one adult that was clearly, I don't know what you'd call it. It was, I don't know if it was the alpha, or if it was one of the higher ranking individuals within the group, but there was clearly one of them that went and sat at the entrance, made a decision as to which den they were going to move to. And it went and it sat at the entrance to that burrow and squeaked repeatedly. All of the others were alarm calling around me. It was like constant little radar beeps going off completely in a 360 degree direction from all sides but that one individual sat on the entrance of the termite mound and just went beep 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 repeatedly until it managed to gather all of the rest of the family together and once they got the first three babies there and they were racing back to go and fetch the others and you could see as soon as the babies got there they were all playful running up and down exploring their new home it was awesome to see. I really, really enjoyed that. And Sean, who is watching in Secunda, you were wondering, and it is a very similar social structure, but you were wondering whether or not dwarf mongoose and meerkats are related. And yes, they're all part of the same, they fall under the same family. It's known as the Herpestidae family, if you're really interested. And it used to include genets, and genets used to fall under the same family. That's now been separated and lumped together under the family Viveridae. But yes, the Herpestidae family, so the meerkats and the mongoose, all unified by the presence of that anal gland. 
which shows traces them back to an original evolutionary ancestor. Now meerkats, of course, many of you will be familiar with them and the incredible way that they run their little families and the way that they protect their youngsters, the babysitters, also very similar in the approach to the dwarf mongoose, although with a slightly less strict alpha system, alpha breeding system. But we don't get them here. And it's just different types of mongoose species evolved to work in different habitats. So the meerkats are more towards the western drier areas, for those of you unfamiliar with them. Whereas in these areas we get the dwarf mongoose, predominantly those are the ones that we see. And we also get the banded mongoose and the slender mongoose, which I've ma both managed to get both of those on camera once. Oh, it's a starling. And then that one, a couple of brief white-tailed mongoose sightings, the one species that is nocturnal. The only one left is a water mongoose. I haven't managed to get that on a live safari and that's because I've hardly seen any in my time in the bush and certainly haven't seen any on Juma yet, but I have seen their tracks. And while we do a race to Juma, um, or a race across to DRC rather, which is where we live, we're gonna try and get the new camera installed and be up again and running as soon as possible. While we do that, let's pop over to Brent and I will catch up with you as soon as possible. So we're nearly in position for some Friday afternoon felines. Uh, we're arriving in the area from what Jamie explained to me, you need to go towards the old hyena den of the Surrey's Road and then head south. So hopefully be able to find them. But it is clearing wonderfully. That dark cloud cover has dissipated quite a bit and it is turning into a magnificent African evening. Contradicting information. I see tracks going that way, but that's not really south, that's more west. I don't see any tracks going that way. So I think we follow the fresh tracks. And while we bumpity bump through here, Paul Rizzo, if I remember correctly, Paul is from Tasmania. So a place with lots of venomous snakes, Australia. And Paul's wondering if I've ever seen a Gabon viper. Now, it is the biggest of the viper uh, or adder family we get in Africa. And they are incredibly beautiful snakes. And I might be able to have a picture of one that I saw last, no, not last year, the year before. I've seen quite a few in the wild. I lived in one of their favorite places to live which is a central African rainforest in uh, the country of Gabon. So I uh, saw so a Gabon viper in Gabon. And Paul, I will try and see if I've got a, a snap of one here. But let me just negotiate our way towards where the Inkakuma pride were lying up, or members of the Inkakuma pride. As far as I know, the amber-eyed lioness, a lioness, a favorite of all of ours, a busy entertaining one of the Birmingham males to the east of us. We are missing one other adult female and whether she's possibly coming to Eastress and also headed off to entertain gentleman callers, who knows, it could be quite a strong possibility because yesterday they were quite close to where those Birmingham boys were. And for an update on those Birmingham boys, they are them are eating a buffalo to the east of us and one of them is being entertained by an Inkahuma. Okay, so still tracks going in here but I'm not seeing any lions. Hopefully they haven't moved. I'm getting a slight sinking sensation. And the tracks go that way. I 
you walking on foot, tracking lines. That is what you're looking for. This is a perfect example. And as you pop through there, you just see that white that sticks out of the bush. And I'm pretty certain, there we go, saw the movement. That's a lion's belly. So often people wonder when we go tracking, how do we spot the lions before we get too close? That's how, because we probably would have seen that from about this distance and the lions would probably be fast asleep without noticing us. Now well, let's get a bit closer now. Boston, Massachusetts, not Tasmania, but Paul says he would love to visit Tasmania. Well, Paul, in Boston, uh, you have, a, but strange enough, my mom lived in Boston for eight years, and she used to play for a professional tennis team in Boston called the Boston Lobsters, and she's a staunch Patriots fan uh, as well, although for ice hockey she supports the Pittsburgh Penguins. I remember now, I think it was nine individuals. We've only got three here. And there's two adult females missing. One, we know where she is. And she's entertaining that Birmingham boy. The other might be doing the same in the east. So that leaves five lionesses with the one sub-adult, which is the one lying in the middle. And there was a young male, and his nickname was Junior. And John is wondering, do we have any updates on Junior? Uh, last I heard, he was on Mala Mala, uh, but I'm not 100% sure he could have dispersed much further by now. Those young males can move big distances, especially a lone young male like that. Oh, it looks like it's roll over time. So when we see lions doing that, that little bit of sand that they've been lying on has got hot, so they roll over to the next piece of sand, which is hopefully a bit cooler. So it looks like they could eat. Not that full probably been enjoying the cool weather we've had for the majority of the day. So for those who are new and um, have joined us in the last couple of months, so as I was saying, the Nkuma Pride used to be nine individuals and there are five adult females now. Sorry, eight individuals I think it was. No, there was nine. It was nine. The first time I saw them, there were nine of them. And that was probably about this time last year, maybe in a, around this time last year. And the missing three are actually not going to come back. They have been killed by the Birmingham boys during that male lion, co uh, male lion takeover, the pushing of the Matimba males to the south, and the Birmingham boys establishing themselves as the dominant male lion force in the northern Sami sands. And I know a lot of people find it very sad. And actually, Andrew and I uh, got special permission to go view uh, and film the carcass of one of the Nkuma lionesses that was killed by a Birmingham boy on Torchwood. 
and he even actually fed off a piece of her and that's not uncommon and for us it's obviously really difficult and we get really attached to these lions that we see on a daily basis but it is normal lion behavior during these pride takeovers you often find the testosterone of the males is really up and something that a slight slap or whatnot which could be completely ignored now that they're permanent individuals can actually just set off that reaction because they're busy chasing other males, they're hyper aggressive at that time and the slightest little thing can set, even by a female can set them off and can end very badly for that, the, that lioness but fortunately now it looks like they have established themselves as the dominant males and they don't seem to be killing lionesses anymore which is a good thing. So a nice big coalition like this is going to give us stability for quite a long time so well, watch me have to eat my words and suddenly a coalition of six males appears out of nowhere. But theoretically a big coalition of, of, of five male lions should give us stability for the next three or four years. See the sun just disappearing. And the reason I corrected myself so quickly there is because there is a rumor of a coalition of nine male lions coming from the north, but they have split as far as I know now. So they're not nine of them anymore, there's four and five, but they are still quite far north of us. Far more pressure. They are probably going to put pressure on the Salati males before they get down to the Birmingham's area. So, Chris in Arizona, I apologize for not explaining about nomadic lions and why Junior is no longer here a bit better, but thanks for reminding me, I can now give you the full update. So, with lionesses, they generally stay within their nasal pride, they don't really become nomadic, unless there's been a huge upheaval, a lot of the pride killed by males or other female pride. Generally, they will stay with a related females in a, in a pride. Young males, however, are chased off, and the reason that they are chased off is genetics. So quite often, a male lion coalition will be in charge for three to four years, and in that time, those young males sired can get to an age where they're able to mate with their moms, their aunts, their sisters. So the adult males of the pride will chase those young males away and they will become nomadic then and they will often wonder for four years three years till they are old enough to establish their own territory or fight another male for territory but quite often what will happen like a young nomadic male like junior will often join up with another coalition of young males. So there could be two other nomadic males, three even, and they might jo join up if they're around a similar age because the odds of them being able to take over a pride as a, as a, as a unit rather than a single individual are much, much higher. So you often find unrelated male lions will often group together to form a stronger coalition where they can challenge for, for a territory against other males. In the Sabi Sands and, and this area of Kruger, it is really unusual to find uh, a single male lion dominating over a pride. This area is really famous for its big coalitions. And there, at the moment, there's the Majinga lions, who I think are four now or five, I can't remember exactly. Before them, there was the Mapoho. They were six initially. We've got these rumors of these sky beds, which are five and four coming down. And uh, in the Salatis were originally five as well. And who's the, oh, the Matimbas were also originally four or five. So this area is really famous for large male lion coalitions. And not too far away from us here, sort of towards the eastern boundary of Kruger on the Mozambique boundary there, is one of the highest densities of lions in the world. So we're in a really lion rich area. Northern Sabi Sands, for the whole Sabi Sands, has got the highest density of lions. But it is really fascinating to watch these dynamics as they shift and change constantly. And as soon as you think you know what's going on, something will happen to prove you completely wrong. So today, for example, I've heard there's an unknown pride of three lionesses sitting in, in just to the east of us. No one's sure who they are. They seem to be relaxed around cars. I'm wondering if it's possibly three sticks lions, but apparently they've been seen somewhere else. And with this dry, 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 weather we're having 
there are, uh, there's a huge possibility of unknown lines coming from the Kruger to these water points in the Sabi Sands. So really exciting times ahead. You see those lion's ears flicking in. You can actually see there's quite a lot of flies on them. And those are called little stable flies. They're actually quite vampiric little guys. And they're constantly are sucking blood. They're the same flies that attack us on drive. But we are quite protected with our African sage rubbed all, um, dwarf wild sage rubbed all of us. Uh, pity the lions don't know that trick. Make life a bit easier for them if they just went and rolled around in some sage. And you can see how the hair on the tip, or oh, you can see them buzzing there, and the hair on the edge of her, her ear is actually starting to disappear from the amount of fly bites. And as these animals get older, it's really, really apparent. You can see their ears become tatty, and that is from biting flies. I'm just going to update the other game drives quickly. One station with Inkomas lying up in the same position. So it is the right time of the day to be sitting. Oh, look, she got a fight when the other one accidentally kicked a dead branch. There we go, that's what we want to see. We want to see some stretching. Now, that's a really good uh, <clears throat> sign, although not the most energetic stretch I've seen, but oh, look at that. I love it when they do that. It almost looks like they're giving themselves a hug. So when we start seeing a little bit of movement like that, there's a little bit of stretch stretches, it's, it's a good sign that they might possibly be about to move. Not just yet. So what will happen is you'll see a bit of stretching. They'll get up, really stretch, generally urinate, defecate, and then start touching each other's faces with their faces, aloe grooming. Sometimes they'll even get up and flop directly on another individual. And that's sort of a precursor to movement. We do need a little bit more stretching than the ones we just saw. I think that stretching was set because of a bit of a kick in the head from one to the other. And a lion, out of all the animals in the bush, really looks the most comfortable when it's having a nap. agrees with me. Deborah, the armchair traveler, says cats, large or small, always look the most comfortable when they sleep. Very, very true, Deborah. You can see that wonderful golden light dropping below that cloud now as another African day ends. And it's amazing to think, as Andrew pans around, that a year ago, that grass would have been as high as that little bush to the left of the lions, and we wouldn't have even been able to probably see them where they were sleeping. They would have been covered by grass. Welcome to Paula in Virginia. Uh, Paula is asking, shouldn't the Nkuma pride be a much bigger pride with only five females if they have to support five male lions? Well, Paula, that's quite a m common misconception that uh, females do all the hunting and the males uh, come and take the kill. A lot of male hunting is done by themselves, and, and now those Birminghams are sitting on a buffalo kill that they killed themselves. So only if they're in the vicinity of the females will they come steal the carcass, so to speak. And also a coalition like the five Birmingham males has multiple prides. So they, as for sure, I know they are over the Kuhumas and the Sticks, but they could be over another pride further to the south or to the east into Kruger, we're not sure. But they don't, the females don't supply the males with food on a weekly, daily basis. It's only if they happen to be in the same vicinity. The Birmingham boys are actually adept buffalo hunters. 
and they do a lot of their own killing. And one must remember that a male lion coalition is constantly on the move, whether it's mating with females or out patrolling, keeping other males out. They often big distances away from the females, so they are forced to catch their own dinner. But if they do have the opportunity and they're close by, they will definitely nick the female's dinner. for lions is wondering about our last male lion coalition which was the two matimba males affectionately known as ginger because he didn't have the darkest mane shame poor ginger and hairy belly who had a very big dark black mane that extended all the way down his belly and they have moved to the south they were pushed by the birmingham boys uh, they've apparently set up territory now in central londolosi um, around the Sand River in quite a small territory but uh, from what I hear they are doing quite well and are seen regularly by the guides there so probably about 10 kilometers to the south of where we're sitting now chatting about nomadic males and I know Jamie's chatted a little bit about nomadic females earlier on the sunset safari and Barbara in Washington is wondering could a single lioness start her own pride if she had some sub-adult females most de definitely Barbara the biggest threat to a, a lioness a nomadic lioness starting her own pride would be other lions. So this area is quite saturated. Most of the areas have a pride that dominates over that. So not only do male lions fight, but different prides of females will fight just as fiercely over territory. So that would be the biggest threat, but it is by all means possible. When prides do split, so where I used to work about 60 kilometers to the east of here, we got a pride that got to about 40, 42, 43 individuals. And it was actually a show on National Geographic called the Mega Pride, which was based on that pride in the Eastern Kruger. Now, they eventually bombshelled into three, almost three prides. So what happens when the pride gets really big like that, if they catch a wildebeest, it's not enough food. So they need to sort of start now catching four wildebeest tonight, five wildebeest tonight. And that's often how you find new prides form. And quite interestingly, I have heard the Kahumas, I think, and this is pure speculation judged on behavior I've heard from the other guides on what happened in Buffalo's Hook. Uh, a giraffe was killed and the Inkahumas killed it, a big adult giraffe, but then the Talamati pride arrived. And the fact that they tolerated each other on that same carcass leads me to believe that the Inkahumas are a small offshoot of the larger Talamati pride because it got too, there was too much competition for food in the pride. So that's how lion prides normally form. And if they spend a long time away from each other, there can often be aggression. But the Nkumas and the Talamatis do share a lot of the same home range. So I think they do come across each other probably more than we know. And I think the Nkumas are an offshoot of the larger Talamati pride, who I can't wait to see one day. Well, these kitties are not looking like moving at all. spot let's why, why don't we just move around a little bit just to change the angle on the sleepy kitties see if we can pick up something else different that we haven't seen from here and hello madam <laughs> look at that she looks very comfortable So, 
Sandy in Florida is one day, since lionesses stay within their natal pride, do they ever mate with their fathers? So what happens, Sandy, is that Generally, a male lion coalition only has about four or five years at the most at the top of a pride before they're chased out by unrelated males. So although it is possible in an open system with wild lion populations like we have, um, it is very unlikely. Sorry, Andy, you want me a bit forward? Yeah, I know what Andy wants to do. He wants to let you look deep into this lioness's eyes. Although she doesn't want to look back at us, she's going to sleep. <coughs> Excuse me. So a perfect example here, yeah, Sandy, is that the sub-adult who's now nearing mating age, uh, was more than likely born to the Matimba males and will now mate with the Birminghams. So that's how lion genetics keep themselves strong. Although it is a very strange and little known fact that lions can inbreed for up to six generations without too much without it causing too much sort of uh, bad hips, disease, etc. And obviously it's not ideal, but this is, happens in areas uh, where lions get separated from the larger meta population, so they can survive, and especially in deserts that, that can happen, the male lions can stay in charge for longer. So there is a sort of genetic safety built in that the lions can mate with their fathers for a few generations without any real negative effects. But once that becomes a constant rolling situation, like with any animal, uh, the genetics will, the genetic pool will start to be getting really, really small and it can lead to lots of defects in birth and disease. But we're lucky, we live in a vibrant, healthy lion area with lots of feeder wild populations. We're right in the northern section of the Sabi Sands, so we've got a really healthy population of lions in the Manuleti that feed through into this area, as well as the Kruger National Park just to our east. And of course, not forgetting the whole southern Sabi Sands that also feed into this area. And there's Andrew going for his artistic Van Gogh shot. Dynamics, population dynamics, and, and even into pride dynamics is not nearly as simple as you think. So Dylan in Iowa is wondering, well, would a male uh, who's fertilized one of these females still fight with the other members of the pride? Very possibly, yes. So there are male lions that have developed a very specialized, and this is the other way Junior might go. He, he might become one of the sneaky lions. So he hangs on the peripheries, finds females and estrus and mates with them. So for a long, long time, everyone's always assumed that the dominant pride males father all the cubs. And with new research, it's turning out that in some areas, 50% uh, of the cubs are fired, of, or sired, sorry, by these sneaky guys uh, that have basically developed, this is the best way as a, a single male lion in an area where there's lots of coalitions to pass on my genetic line. So they will find a female in East just mate with her on the sly, on the edge, quite sneakily, and then disappear as soon as those dominant males start roaring or coming in. So there's, that's a possibility for Junior might go that way as well. And if, if he comes across a lioness and she's not an estrus, he could fight with her, he could kill her, you never know. But uh, I think nothing's really as simple as we would like to be. And that's the fascinating thing about being out here every day, being able to watch these dynamics and watch how they change and watch how we thought was a fact can be proven wrong in, a, in an instant. We must remember that <clears throat> we wrote all the books, but the lions forgot to read them. So they don't know what's right and wrong. They just do what lions do. Thank you. 
A big hello to Raisa, one of our regulars in Finland. Raisa would like to know, what is the biggest prey species these three lioness could take down? Well, I'd say they're quite comfortably take down an adult buffalo uh, without too much trouble, just three of them. But one must remember as well that a lot of animal behavior can be area specific rather than species specific. So in certain areas, lions will hunt elephants. They don't here, but also I don't think three lionesses would succeed on a, on a quite a large elephant. But I'd say they would happily take down a buffalo. They might even have a go at that hippo that's at the Juma Pan at the moment. Uh, he is in, isn't in the best condition, but normally in my, my experience where I've seen lioness hunt hippo, there has been a male adding that extra strength. Although, actually, I have seen a, a group of six lionesses take down an adult hippo before as well. But generally, I'd say adult buffalo or hippo is about the largest that these three could do on their own. So, Jamie is out with the new camera. We're doing some tests that will hopefully be able to extend some of the safaris into the darkest night. We're going to keep an eye on these lions and let's go see how Jamie and Brian are doing on the new vehicle with the new camera. And out into the semi-darkness we go. And we are indeed testing out a new camera that should hopefully bring you some incredible shots during times where we might not be able to do the same thing. So very, very exciting stuff happening. And we're just at the moment at the preliminary stage of figuring a way around the camera. So Brian's still getting to know how it all works and it's a very, very different style of camera. Funny things happen and we get some odd moments, maybe some odd colors. It is definitely not Brian's fault. We are experimenting to be able to bring you new and exciting things. I was going to race across to the hyena den, but I think we might actually run out of time on our sunset safari. Luckily for us, it seems as though the hyenas have come through to us. Let's go and have a quick look. See who's lying up at the dam. While Peter's away, the hyenas have come to have a little bit of a swim. Let's just cut the corner here. So we don't scare them or startle them in any way. Hello, you three. What a nice spot to be. Is it three or is it... Oh, no, that's a rock. Sorry, that's a rock, not a hyena. <laughs> I thought I saw another one. There we go, enjoying an evening swim. And the last few rays of the afternoon sun. Uh, I have absolutely no idea which hyenas we happen to be looking at. Difficult to tell straight away without any context. Probably some of either the males or the lower ranking females that are separate from the den site itself. Let's see, we've got 15 minutes left. I'm still trying to calculate in my head if we've got time to get to the den and enjoy a sighting there, or if not, and I think it might be worth sticking with these guys a bit. You also never know what kind of mischief they might get up to. The hippo hasn't moved all that far off. He is right behind the vehicle, so we can't show you exactly where. It'd be interesting to see if he decided to come off Come, up, come across and show off the interloping hyenas that have wandered into what I'm sure he considers to be his turf. Oh, there we go. There might be a call here, thinking about it. Come on. You can't stop. You can't start like that and then just stop completely. You've got to finish it up. Here we go. Building up. And some more. Come on, you can do it. Give us the full contact call. It'd be interesting. 
interesting if he does do the full hyena whoop. Lying down. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> How oh, did you hear that sound difference? How amazing is this? One more time. For luck. Thought about it. That was Awesome. <laughs> How many of you have got to see such an extraordinary view of a hyena doing the full contact call? And what was so epic about that moment was the position that we're sitting in and with the empty dam, it echoed across the open spaces and from the dam walls and you get a full idea of just how powerful those vocal cords are. That was a contact call to different members of the call, but, or different members of the clan, but that was epic. And I never knew that they could do it lying down. I mean, I, I assumed that they could call lying down like that, but you can really see how much of a difference it made when that hyena stood up. The instant resonance in the increase in sound as soon as it was on its feet. So calling across to the different clan members, letting them know where this hyena is, and of course, letting rival clans No, the battery is doing silly things. And just to let you guys know, with this camera, the battery is doing funny things and we're going to have to send you back over to Brent while we try and sort it out. And we're having an odd moment here, so we just want to try and fix it up and we'll catch up with you as soon as we've worked out what's happening. There we go, it seems to be okay. How are we doing there, Brian? <laughs> Brian's not sure. <laughs> So we're going to send you over to Brent while we fix this camera and we will be back with you very shortly. So we've got a head that's just popped up and we're hoping, we saw a little movement, so we are hoping that they might get up and move before the end of the sunset safari. Oh, the big yawn coming. Nice, Andrew. So that's really good. Behavior, another yawn off to the left, I mean to the right, another one behind. So another good sign that they are maybe considering moving. Not just this very second, but the yawning is a good sign. Maybe nap time's a little bit longer. There's another yawn. You can see those massive canines that are used to anchor on their, on their prey. As we look there, as she yawns, you can see there's actually a bit of a gap between her canines and her premolars and molars. And when a lion or a leopard go for that throat hold that is so common when they're bringing down their prey, it's not actually their teeth that do the job. So there's a gap in their teeth that's specially designed to pinch the, os uh, the esophagus closed. So their canines anchor uh, behind the esophagus and their premolars and molars anchor on the other side. And there's a little special gap that basically just pinches the esophagus closed and suffocates their prey. At least we got a yawn or two, oh, or three. Temperature's dropped a couple of degrees since we've been here. So it is getting cooler. And the cats, the big cats, do like to move in the cool. So 
So they're, they could eat. They're not starving just yet, but they could definitely eat. And hopefully they'll move down towards our camp this evening. Oh, flop. It's wonderful having these big cats on property. We didn't see them for a long time, so really great to have the Nkuhumas back. So the Inkahuma pride is named after one of my favorite trees we get out here, which is the brown ivory. And Inkahuma is the Shangan name for that tree. So beautiful, beautiful tree. And it was named by some of the Juma guides. And what happened is the first time this pride was ever seen was underneath a large brown ivory tree in Biffle's Hook. And that's where they got their name from. Come on, ladies, give us a bit of action. Oh, another yawn coming. <laughs> don't, don't put your claws in me. There's a little bit of snarl there. I think that was an accidental clawing. As she stretched, she just happened to hook uh, the claw into the other lioness's shoulder. But it doesn't look like they're about to move this very second. And hopefully that hyena with Jamie gives you some more awesome audio. I think he's going to, as Brent mentioned it, keeps doing those low building up calls. Here we go again. Come on, boy. And this time around, watch the way that his throat works and contracts. This is so awesome. This is a first for me to manage to get this on camera. Can you see how the muscles are contracting? Pulling the larynx down, deepening the sound. Come on, boy. almost like a hum. Roar is absolutely right. You can barely see his mouth move as he makes the sound. It's entirely resonance. And in fact, I think he probably keeps the mouth mostly closed to, or at that particular position, to amplify the sound that he's making. Oh, distracted by whichever hyena is currently having a drink. Somebody with a much, or a much rounder belly than he happens to have. Somebody's had a meal recently. The third hyena wandered off while we were just discussing and fixing up the camera issues. He's a very round hyena waddling off. Come on, boy. Give us one more contact call to end off our sunset safari. <laughs> There's nothing like the sound of a hyena to really epitomize the sounds of the African bush. And that was really, truly a special sighting. I know that Scott's been trying for ages. I know all of the presenters have been trying to get a hyena calling on screen for you at least over the last few months so that I think was a first for all of the current presenters on the ground off he wanders towards the den 
And Mauricio, Mauricio also really enjoyed it. Mauricio is watching in Texas. And Mauricio, you've said that you always thought seeing it in action was the best because you always thought that when, with, whenever you imagine them calling or making that sound that we've heard so often but not seen, that they would have their heads up. And in this case, and in all cases actually, they contact call with their heads often almost at the level of the ground. And I've spoken about it before and questioned why that might be. One, of course, is the theory that it might bounce off the ground and echo and amplify in that way. I think, personally, a good explanation is that it's the good posture for the way that their throat can open up and bring out the resonance of that particular sound. Now, you can't see them, but the hyenas are disappearing off towards the hyena den. I think they're on their way there. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of our sunset safari. So it was a brief moment spent with the hyenas. I promise you that I'll go and check in with the hyena den tomorrow morning on the sunrise safari. Unless something, of course, drastic change and we drive out and there's lions or there's a leopard wandering through. You just never know what the next morning is going to hold. But a big thank you to all of us for joining us and for your questions and comments, as well as to Brian for his fantastic camera work even with a new and different camera. I'm sure you'll all agree we have extraordinary cameramen here at Wild Earth. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and have a wonderful day. I'm going to send you back across to Brent for your last few moments to spend with the lions. Cheers for now. So we have a little bit more movement here. And as you can see, one head is up. It's the sub-adult. I'm just going to turn on my lights as it gets a bit darker here. And this is the time of the day when lions start moving. They sleep for an average 20 hours a day. Oh, there we go. This is the stretching I was talking about earlier. And there we go. Maybe go, not yet. I think it's ablution time first. sky behind her. You can see they've definitely eaten something in the last few days. Oh, there we go. Just decided that's a better spot to lie down in for a little bit. A bit cooler. So there we go. Back with the two adults. I think they're probably going to get moving in the next 45 minutes. Not just yet. Hopefully they do come down towards <laughs> Juma. So keep an eye out later on the Juma pan cam or dam cam. still resting even though it's been quite a cool day they do have some food in their bellies so they're not overly hungry oh, look at those eyes so Dylan in Iowa has put me on the spot. Uh, between their teeth, he's asking, between the two large canines, are there six teeth? I think they're four. Those are the incisors uh, between the two canines. If I remember correctly, there could be four, but I, you might be right, Dylan, there could be six. But it has been a spectacular sunset. Sorry, I've really enjoyed having you guys with us, and I know Jamie has as well. And from Andrew and myself, don't forget to join us on the Sunrise Safari and from the rest of the Safari, sorry, Safari Live team, of course. And hopefully these lions are still about or a leopard or two. But for the last few seconds of drive, I was going to say, look into a lioness's eyes, but she's fast asleep.